Wow, we are going to learn so many cool things on this homeschool pop video. All right, what's the first thing we should learn? How about the purpose of government? Governments are formed to keep people safe and to help people work together. The government does that by making laws. Laws are rules made by the government to keep people safe and to help people work together. You see, laws are the way governments fulfill their purpose to keep people safe and to help people work together. Some laws you might know. What about this one? You must not cross the road when the light is red. This is an important law because it keeps people safe. It keeps people safe and that's one of the main purposes of government is to keep people safe. If you cross the road when the light is red, you can get hurt. So they set up a law. You must not cross the road when the light is red. What about this law? You must not drive faster than the speed limit. This is a law the government set up because it wanted to help keep people safe and help people work together. When you drive faster than the speed limit, you can hurt yourself and you can hurt other people. It's not safe. Now, it also doesn't help people work together because when you're on the road with other drivers, you're working together to get to where you need to go and you need everyone to follow the laws. You must not drive faster than the speed limit is a law because it keeps people safe and it helps people work together. Here's one I'm sure that you know. You must not steal things. This is a law that's very important because it keeps people's possessions safe and it helps people work together. You can't work together and help other people if you're taking things that belong to them. That is why the government has a very important law that you must not steal things. When you steal things, it hurts other people, it doesn't keep people safe, and it doesn't help people work together. The purpose of government is to keep people safe and to help people work together. But how does the government make sure people follow the laws? Police officers! Police officers make sure people follow the laws and catch people who don't. They also keep our communities safe and help people who are in trouble. Then, after they've been caught by the police, the court system helps decide if a person has broken a law and what the punishment should be. The purpose of government is to keep people safe and to help people work together. The government doesn't just write laws and enforce them. The government also provides many services. Services like fire departments. That's something the government runs because it helps keep people safe. It's part of the purpose of the government to keep people safe. And that's why they provide the service of fire departments. The government also provides the postal service. The postal service is the way that we send letters and packages and all kinds of fun things. And it helps us work together. That's part of the purpose of government, is to help us work together. And the postal service helps us do that. That's why the government provides that service. The government also provides the services of libraries. Libraries are very, very important. The government runs those because libraries teach us and we get knowledge. And with that knowledge, it helps us work together. That's why the government provides libraries. 
The government also provides public schools. This is very, very important because everyone has the right to learn. And when we learn and when we get an education, we are able to work together better, which is why the government provides schools. The government also provides the services of the military who protect us here and overseas, and it's very important for us to be safe. The government has to keep us safe, and the government does that through the service of brave men and women who serve in the military. The government also builds public structures like parks and bridges and roads. This is very important because it helps us work together. So how do we pay for all this? Well, the money for the government comes from taxes. Taxes are payments that people make to the government. Governments are formed to keep people safe and to help people work together. Well, that just about does it. If somebody ever asks you, what does the government do and why is it there? You'll know what to tell them because you watched this video. How cool is that? You're doing great. You're increasing your skills just like this racer, you know, racing on the water. You're increasing your skills. You're doing a wonderful job. And next, we are going to learn about the White House. The White House is a special place. The White House is where the President of the United States lives and works. The White House is in a place called Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States of America. It is located here, between Maryland and Virginia. Now this is interesting. Did you know DC stands for District of Columbia? Washington DC is also called the District of Columbia. Really interesting, isn't it? So next time somebody says, hey, Washington DC, he'd say, hey, DC stands for District of Columbia. And they'll be like, wow, oh my goodness, wow. Cool, so the White House is in Washington DC and it is where the president lives and works. There's only one president that didn't do that. George Washington was the first president of the United States. He is the only president who never lived in the White House. And there's a simple reason for that. The White House hadn't been built yet. When the White House was first built, it had a different name. Did you know that? It was originally called the President's House, which makes sense because it is the President's House. But when people saw it and saw the white walls, they said this is a white house. So it had a nickname. People used to call it the White House as a nickname. In fact, so many people called it the White House that President Theodore Roosevelt in 1901 said, okay, we'll make it the White House. We won't call it the President's House anymore. He changed the name officially to the White House and we've called it that ever since. Unfortunately, there was one time when the White House went through something more dramatic than a name change. You see, for three years, the United States was at war with Great Britain. It was known as the War of 1812. Well, you know, things got rowdy and crazy as they do, but then the British soldiers set the White House on fire. That was in 1814, and it took three years to rebuild it. The outside stood, but everything on the inside was burned, and it took three years years to rebuild it and remodel it so James Madison the president at the time wasn't able to live there for a while okay okay so getting set on fire in 1814 wasn't the best moment for the White House but the White House has enjoyed a peaceful and rich history look how much the trees have grown through the years and they've added a lot of cool stuff to the White House and in the White House 
I mean, it is so awesome. Did you know the White House has a swimming pool and a movie theater and a bowling alley? Yeah, that's right. Even bowling? Here's a bit of a diagram of the White House. Now, here is where the president lives, right in the middle, and that's where the swimming pool, the bowling alley, the movie theater are, all that fun stuff. And here is where the president works. It's a place called the Oval Office, and it's called that because it's an office in the shape of an... Oh, come on! Oval, yes! The Oval Office is where he works. Now this is really neat. The White House is on Pennsylvania Avenue, and we're gonna give you the address if you wanna ever write a letter to the White House. The address is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. How neat is that? Not only can you write to the White House, you can visit the White House. Almost anyone can visit the White House. You have to contact your local member of Congress if you are interested. Oh, this is such a heavy cart. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, it's hard work. You know, a lot of times learning can be hard work, too. But we hope that these videos are really helpful and make learning fun so that learning isn't hard like pushing this cart. Oh, my goodness. All right. Uh, what's the next thing we should learn about? Let's learn about the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is a massive statue in New York City. It is on Liberty Island in what is called New York Harbor. Now they called it Liberty Island after the Statue of Liberty got there because the Statue of Liberty is the coolest thing about Liberty Island. It's actually a very, very small island in New York Harbor. Okay, so you might look at pictures and wonder, oh my goodness, how big is it? How big is this thing? Well, the statue itself is over 151 feet tall. This is a massive statue. Oh, huge. Now, you may not know this. The word liberty means freedom. The Statue of Liberty is a statue that celebrates the freedoms we all share. Now there are symbols of freedom all throughout this statue. The torch itself that she carries represents freedom. And in the statue, she is stepping over broken chains. The Statue of Liberty is a statue of freedom. Hey! Did you know the Statue of Liberty was a gift from France? How cool is that? The country of France gave us the Statue of Liberty. Pretty huge gift, a really generous gift. It costs them a lot of money to make. As you might have guessed, the statue was built in France, and August Bartholdi sculpted the statue. This dude was like an amazing sculptor, right? Didn't he do a good job? And they did it out in the open because they wanted the people of France to get excited about paying for this statue because it costs a lot of money to make. It's made out of copper and it's a whole lot of copper. And so they built this thing in France. It was completed in 1886, which was actually 10 years after when they wanted to finish it. They wanted to finish it by 1876, the 100 year anniversary of when the United States became a country. I mean, wow, even though it took longer to complete than they thought, what an incredible accomplishment. Just look at this statue made in the 1800s. Such an amazing gift from France. Wow. Oh, who, who, who is this guy? Hey, 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 get out, get out of here. What do you, what do you, what do you think this is? I'm not going to just show up here. Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh. I'm sorry, that wasn't nice. How about this? We've got, you know, this Statue of Liberty video. Why don't you, why don't you help us out the last, the last little bit? Okay? Okay, good. 
Well, the last thing we want to share with you is why the statue is green. Why is the Statue of Liberty green? Well, remember, the Statue of Liberty is made of copper. When copper is exposed to air and water, it can have a protective green coating called copper oxide. It's almost like it's a coat, it's a jacket to protect the copper called copper oxide. Here's what the Statue of Liberty's face used to look like, and that was the color of the entire statue. And then it looked like this. The Statue of Liberty is now covered in copper oxide. It took 30 years for the Statue of Liberty to turn completely green. Do you want to try something fun? You can take a penny. A penny is also made out of copper. And you can do the same thing to the penny that happened to the Statue of Liberty. You can leave it outside and over time that penny as it's exposed to the air and to the water from the rain it will be covered in copper oxide over time. That green protective coating and you can see that happen for yourself. You can check back with that penny over time and you'll be like oh my goodness you're turning green just like the Statue of Liberty Abraham Lincoln can turn green too Wow the Statue of Liberty a symbol of freedom in New York Harbor in New York City a gift from France a reminder of the freedoms we all share for many people who came to the United States of America in search of a better life, the Statue of Liberty was the first thing that they would see. A Statue of Freedom for you and me. Wow, <laughs> that rhymed pretty good. <laughs> Here's our friend Fred. We heard that he just took up the harp. He just started playing the harp. Fred, we can't, we can't hear it. We're having audio problems with Fred right now. Fred, you look so happy playing. We we can't hear you, okay? You got you got to wear your mic or something. We can't hear the music. Oh, he doesn't even know. He doesn't even, isn't that nice? You know, Fred is just plucking away. He's having a good time. You know, kind of like we're having a good time right now with these learning videos. And next, we are going to learn about producers and consumers. We're going to find out what a producer is and what a consumer is and the difference between the two. Whenever someone buys something, whether it's a good or a service, they are called the consumer. The consumer is the one who buys the good or the service. Now, the person who makes the good or provides the service is called the producer. The person who makes the good or provides the service is called the producer. The person who makes or provides the good or service is the producer. And the person who buys the good or service is the consumer. So the producer makes it. The consumer buys it. For example, here's a picture of a man who's making a pizza. This man is the producer. Now see these people. These people are the consumers. They are the ones that bought the pizza. The producer made the pizza. The consumers buy the pizza. Here's a man who's working very hard. He's making bread. Now I need your help on this one. Do you think this man is a producer or a consumer? He's making the bread. This man is the producer. He's the one that's making the bread. Now, see this lady. Do you think this lady is the producer or the consumer? Yeah, this lady is the consumer. She's going to buy the bread. The baker made the bread, but this lady is going to buy the bread. She is the consumer. Look at this picture. It's a lady giving a haircut to this man. Now, what do you think the lady is? Is the lady the producer or is the lady the consumer? The lady is the one giving the haircut. 
Yeah, the lady is the producer. Now the man sitting in the chair, is he the consumer or the producer? He's the one buying the haircut. Yeah, the man is the consumer. The one who buys the good or service is the consumer. The one who provides the good or service is the producer. You might not know this, but did you know even kids can be consumers and producers? How cool is that? Here we've got a picture for you to look at, and we're going to need your help. You see, in this picture, the kids are either producers or consumers. Wonder if you could help me figure out how many are producers and how many are consumers. So, how many of these kids are producers? This is a picture of a lemonade stand. How many of the kids are producers? Yeah, two. Two of them are producers. Now, this might be easier. How many of the kids are consumers? How many of them are going to buy the lemonade? Yeah, three. Now, do you remember the last time you were a consumer? Think about it for a moment. When was the last time you bought a good or a service? When was the last time you were a consumer? It probably wasn't that long ago. We buy goods and services all the time. Neat. <laughs> now, have you ever been a producer? Many kids haven't been producers before, but you may have been. A common example of kids being a producer is at a lemonade stand. Have you ever been a producer? It's fun. You might want to try it out sometime. Remember, the one who buys the good or service is the consumer. The one who provides the good or service is the producer. So, the next time you're a consumer, you buy something like a burger or a toy or a piece of gum or a haircut, you can know, hey, I was a consumer. And you can point to the person who provided it and say, thank you. Thank you for being such a great producer. Hey, when is it going to be my turn? I want to be in this compilation video too. Okay, let's see. I'm going to teach about Mount Rushmore. This is Mount Rushmore. It is located in South Dakota in the Black Hills National Forest. Do you know where South Dakota is? South Dakota is here in the Midwestern United States. And this is where Mount Rushmore is. Mount Rushmore is a monument. A monument is something that is made to give honor to a person or an event. This monument gives honor to four United States presidents. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. Before the monument was made, the mountain was already named after a man named Charles Rushmore. Charles Rushmore was a lawyer from New York. He visited the Black Hills in the 1880s. Over 400 people worked to carve Mount Rushmore out of stone. That's a lot of people. Carving is changing something's appearance by cutting it. The workers used explosives like dynamite for a lot of the carving. They used smaller tools for the details on the president's faces and to smooth it out. A South Dakota state historian 
thought of the idea for the monument as a way to bring more visitors to the state. The historian originally wanted the faces of different people on Mount Rushmore, but the artist he hired said more people would come to see the presidents. Mount Rushmore started being made in the 1920s. Work on it began in 1927 and it was finished in 1941, which was 14 years later. That's a long time! The artist wanted the monument to show more of the president's upper bodies. But the United States was getting ready for war in 1941, so the money for finishing Mount Rushmore stopped coming. Some Native American groups don't like the monument because the land used to belong to them. The United States government treated them poorly and took the land away from them. So they are upset that Mount Rushmore was built on that land. So a Native American chief from the Sioux tribe planned his own monument near there that would honor a Native American named Crazy Horse. So we learned today that Mount Rushmore was carved out of stone. Work on Mount Rushmore began in the 1920s. It has the faces of four United States presidents. Do you remember the president's names? What is his name? Great job! That's George Washington! How about him? That's right! That's Thomas Jefferson! What is his name? Yes! That's Theodore Roosevelt! Can you name this president? Yes! You got it! That's Abraham Lincoln! Great job! You did so well guessing those presidents' names and learning all about Mount Rushmore today. We've had so much fun, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye! Hey, Petey! I know, I know, I heard about your plane. You know, it's a cool plane, you know, and and it's it's neat. I, I don't know if it flies, or you, you look pretty confident that it's going to fly, which is cool. Yeah, I, I see you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, thanks for waving. Thanks for saying hello. You know, we're actually in the middle of learning. We're, we're in the middle of learning a lot of new cool things right now. So I actually do have to go. Hi, you're still waving. Okay. Um, we're going to go uh, because now we need to learn about goods and services. What goods and services are and how to tell the difference. The first thing we need to understand is that everything you buy is either a good or a service. A good is something you can touch with your hands, like a skateboard. A skateboard is a good. It's something you can buy and you can touch with your hands. Now a service is a job you pay someone else to do. A great example of that is painting a house. Painting a house is a service. It's a job you pay someone else to do. So, a good is something you can touch with your hands, and a service is a job you pay someone else to do. Let's look at some more examples. A car is a good. It's something you can touch. A car wash is a service. It's something you pay someone else to do. If you were to buy a roll of carpet, that is a good. It's something you can touch. But laying carpet is a service. When it gets installed, that is a service. 
last example, a pair of shoes is a good. If you bought shoes, that's a good. That's something you can touch. But if your shoes break, the shoe repair is a service. It's a job that you pay someone else to do. Everything we buy is either a good, something we can touch with our hands, or a service, a job we pay someone else to do. So let's give you a try. Help us figure out if it is a good or a service. We're going to do a little game that we call at Homeschool Pop. Good or service. We're going to show you a picture and you're going to tell us whether you think it's a good or a service. Here's our first one. Bread. Bread is a... Is it a good or a service? Yeah, bread is a good. It's something you can touch. Try this one. Baking a cake. Baking a cake is a... You know which one? It's a service. It's a job you pay someone else to do. What about this one? A medical checkup. A medical checkup is a... Is it a good or a service? Yeah, it's a service. It's a job you pay someone else to do. What about this one? A bicycle. A bicycle is a... Yeah, it's a good. It's something that you buy that you can actually touch. Good job. We all like this one. Pizza delivery is a... Do you know which one it is? A good or a service? It's a service. It's a job you pay someone else to do. Here's our last one. A pizza is a... We had to do this <laughs> after the pizza delivery. What is a pizza? A pizza is a good. It's something that you buy that you can actually touch. Awesome job. Thanks for playing. Everything you buy is a good or a service. A good is something you can touch. A service is a job you pay someone else to do. Well, that wraps it up. Next time you buy something, you can ask yourself, am I buying a good or a service? And you'll know the right answer because you watched this whole video. We are so happy to have you with us. I mean, you are so awesome. You really are. Oh, you like my poster? <laughs> Mr. Whiskers poster, you know? It's pretty cool. Pretty cool, you know? <laughs> it's a pretty cool poster. Pretty cool cat, too. I wonder what he would like to learn about next. If he would learn from one of our videos, what would he like to learn next? Hmm. How about... Uh, hmm. Let's learn about... Urban, suburban, and rural areas. These three words, urban, suburban, and rural, describe where we live. Some people live in urban areas, some people live in rural areas, and some people live in suburban areas. We're going to learn all three of these different types of areas so you can describe where you live. The first type of area that we're going to learn is urban urban areas an urban area is a city it is crowded with lots of buildings and people here we have a great example of an urban area the buildings are close together they're very tall lots of people and traffic would come through here it might be very loud this is an urban area a city environment Here's another great example of an urban environment. Look at these tall buildings and lights. This is a city. If it's a city, that means it's an urban area. This is an urban area. 
Here's another urban area. Lots of buildings, lots of buildings. They're all close together. Some of them are very tall. You can imagine all the traffic, all the people there. This is an urban area. Here's another example of an urban area and you see all the people, crowds of people. Urban areas are very crowded. Lots of people, lots of traffic, not just in cars, but foot traffic. Lots of people walking in urban area. Here's another example of an urban area. We know it's an urban area because it's a picture of a city. All cities are urban areas areas. This is an urban area. Tons of buildings, many of them tall, lots of people, lots of traffic. Here's another great picture of an urban area. All the people, all the buildings, everything's close together, everything's crowded. This is an urban area. To review, an urban area is a city. It is crowded with lots of buildings, and people. The second type of area is suburban. Suburban areas. A suburban area is near a city and it's often called the suburbs. It's less crowded than the city. The buildings are smaller. There are less people than are in the urban areas. Here is an example of a suburban environment. It's less crowded, it's quieter than the urban areas. People live in houses with yards. They usually drive because they aren't able to walk everywhere on foot. Here is another suburban area. As you can see, it's less crowded than the city. The houses have yards, there's more space. It's a little bit more quiet. It's a suburban area. Here's another suburban area, and this is looking up from the sky, and you can see all the homes. All the homes have yards. There's a little bit more space. It's not as crowded. It's not as busy as the urban areas. Here's a picture of a suburban area, and you can see different stores. There's a little bit more space in between them. In an urban area, everything is totally crowded, but in a suburban area, there's a little bit more space. Here's our final picture of a suburban area. You can look and see it's not as crowded as the urban areas. This is a suburban area, just a little more space, a little more quiet. To summarize, a suburban area is near a city and it's often called the suburbs. It is less crowded than the city, the buildings are smaller, and there are less people than are in the urban areas. The third and final type of area is rural. A rural area is away from the cities and suburbs where everything is spread out. It is not crowded. There are not many people or buildings. Here's an example of a rural area. It's a rural area because it's not in the city or the suburbs. Everything is very spread out. There are not a lot of people and not a lot of buildings. Here's another example of a rural area. Look, there aren't that many buildings, that many people. Everything is very spread out. It's rural. Here's another picture of a rural area. Look how spread out everything is. You don't see the crowds, you don't see all the people, you don't see any big buildings. It's a rural area. Look at this picture of a rural area. It's close up to a house, but if you can look in the background, there isn't much of anything else around. Everything is spread out. There aren't that many buildings. It's not in a neighborhood. It's rural. Here's our final picture of a rural area. Look, it's not in a neighborhood. It's not in the city. It's not the suburbs. It's a rural area where everything is spread out. There aren't a lot of people and there aren't a lot of buildings. To summarize, a rural area is away from the cities and suburbs where everything is spread out. It is not crowded. There are not many people or buildings. 
So where do you live? Do you live in an urban environment, the city? Or do you live in the rural environment where everything's spread out? Or do you live in a suburban area or the suburbs that's near a city, but it's not as crowded, it's not as loud as the city? Where do you live? Cool. We're going to find out how much you learn. We're going to play a game that we're calling Urban, Rural, or Suburban. And we're going to show you some areas, and you tell us which one it is. Here's our first one. Is this a picture of an urban area, a rural area, or a suburban area? Suburban. Great job. Let's try this one. Is this urban, rural, or suburban? Great job! It's an urban area. Let's try this one. Is it urban, rural, or suburban? It's rural! Great job! This one looks like fun. Is it urban, rural, or suburban? Yeah, it's urban. Here's another one. Is it urban, rural, or suburban? Yeah, it's suburban. Look at this one closely. Is this urban? Rural or suburban? Yeah, it's another suburban one. We gave you two in a row, didn't we? Try this one now. Is this urban, rural, or suburban? Yes, this is a rural area. Here's our final one. Is this urban, rural, or suburban? It's urban. Awesome job. Wow, you completed the video. That is so impressive. Well, you might notice there's a circle right here on this video page that you can click to subscribe to our channel or you can click this rectangle to go to another one of our videos. But keep learning. Learning is so cool.